Hey, Outliers. Welcome to a brand new edition of Great Books Distilled. And this episode is actually the first of a new type of episode that we're going to start airing, which is a book summary. So this first episode is all about The Warrior Ethos, which is a book written by Stephen Pressfield. I'll talk about the significance and some of the backstory there in just a second. But I want to quickly talk about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it relates to everything else we're doing at Outlier Academy. So we've always, you know, for the last two years since day one, done one-on-one interviews with just some of the world's best authors. We're talking New York Times bestsellers. We're talking just exceptional, exceptional authors and books. And so in those conversations, we don't really try to distill the book. We talk about a lot of the principles in it. We cover how it's written. We cover some of the backstory. We cover how to apply what's in the book. You know, if you listen to that interview, you're going to learn a lot, but it's not going to be necessarily the same as reading the book. And so we're going to start doing two things that are related going forward that are going to be different. One is we're going to start doing one-off standalone book summaries. So these are going to be me reading through a book, distilling it for all of you, taking a book that would take you hours and hours and hours to read and turning it into something you could hopefully read in 30, 45, 60 minutes. The episode lengths are definitely going to vary depending on the length of the book. And that's what we're going to cover this week. This is just a standalone book summary. What we're also going to do going forward is every time we have an author on, we're going to try to record both a book summary. So it's me doing the same thing I'm doing today for the book that we're going to cover. We're going to release that at the same time, maybe the day before or day after as the interview with the author. And so going forward, whenever you listen to one of our author interviews, that should be paired with a book summary. And again, like everything that we're doing, the entire goal is just one to deliver more value to you. This feels incredibly valuable. You know, we're going to be covering everything from annual shareholder letters from people like Nick Sleep, Constellation Software, Berkshire Hathaway in totality. So literally, I'll read all those letters, compress them, record a conversation that's maybe one or two hours long, all the way to standalone books like this, which are not necessarily about building a business. It's not necessarily about investing. It's not about the topics that we typically cover, but it's something I think is important that's related. And that's exactly what we're covering this week. So this book, again, it's The Warrior Ethos by Stephen Pressfield, and I'm just going to read a little bit of a summary about what it is, why I think it's important. Stephen Pressfield's The Warrior Ethos is a deep historical examination of the values and ethics of warriors throughout history, from the ancient Spartans to Japanese samurai to Alexander the Great, and how these values can be applied to the battles we each fight. We all struggle daily to find and defend our sense of purpose, to show up as our best selves, to overcome the obstacles we face in our own pursuits. In that struggle, there's much we can learn and apply from the world's great warriors and warrior cultures. And I think there's no one better to write this book than Stephen Pressfield. Um, he, If you're not familiar with Stephen Pressfield, it just absolutely epic, incredible, incredible author. And, and the reason is because he's written everything from Academy Award winning screenplays. So he wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance, And that was actually his earliest work was in advertising and then it was writing screenplays. He's also written some fantastic, some of my favorite nonfiction books. You know, if you're looking for a recommendation there, The War of Art is incredible. If you do anything that's creative, anything that you have to push through in order to actually get to completion and and be able to find just a a great idea and, and be able to execute it. The book is amazing. It basically examined what happens when you set out to try to create something, all the forces that come against you and how you can overcome those. So that's the war of art. Highly, highly recommend it. But, you know, why is he, has he written a book about the warrior ethos? Well, he's written a number of books about wars and warriors, ancient and modern ones, external and internal wars, real wars from history, imagined wars. My favorite book that he's written on kind of wars and warriors is Gates of Fire, which tells the story of the Spartan 300 sent to fight and die against the Persian emperor King Xerxes. You know, if you've watched the movie 300, you've seen one take on that story. It's literally my favorite book of all time. It's incredible. And it feels like somebody who did the hard work to figure out what it was actually like, what was actually going on, and tell real narratives and real story. You know, it just feels incredibly authentic. But it's not all, you know, historically accurate. Not everything in the book is something that actually happened. And so it's this kind of wonderful part historical tale, part connecting the dots and creating a narrative that kind of binds it all together. So he wrote Gates of Fire. It's an incredible book. The audiobook is amazing. So if you're interested in the audiobook, get it. But he's also written a bunch of other books, The a Man at Arms, The Virtues of War, Killing Rommel, The Afghan Campaign, Tides of War. We will link to all of these in the show notes. And so he's written about war for a long time. Here's what he says about the warrior ethos. Wars change, warriors don't. We are all warriors. Each of us struggles every day to define and defend our sense of purpose and integrity to justify our existence on the planet and to understand if only within our own hearts who we are and what we believe in. Do we fight by a code? If so, what is it? What is the warrior ethos? Where does it come from? And what form does it take today? 
So that is what we're going to explore. And, you know, I'm going to start these by sharing the book in three sentences just to give you a really short condensed version. And then, you know, I'm going to go through a bunch of ideas and a bunch of tales kind of loosely grouped. So here's the book in three sentences. When we speak of the warrior ethos, or really speaking of is warrior ethics, because the word ethos in Latin, it means ethics. And so warriors prize virtues, including courage, honor, loyalty, integrity, love, and selflessness, many of which evolved as a counterpoise to fear and self-preservation. And the reason I think it's really important, I'm going to add a little bit of commentary here, you know, apologies. But the reason that I find learning from warriors so valuable is so much of what I think of warrior ethics and, and some of those virtues that we just talked about. At the end of the day, these are all things that can help you to be a much better leader. And what I mean by that is so much of warrior culture, warrior ethos is a call to be the best version of yourself possible, a call to persist through adversity, a call to be selfless instead of only focusing on yourself, a call to fight honorably as opposed to try to fight in a way that's not particularly honorable And so that is how I think about why this is applicable. I also just think throughout all of history, there's been war. There have been warriors. I think it would personally be a miss to not try to learn from those warriors throughout history. So here's kind of the last sentence in the three sentence summary. True warriors lead from the front. They prize valor and honor as highly as victory. They embrace adversity and shared suffering, and they exemplify selflessness. So what we're going to talk about over the next little bit is what is the warrior ethos? why warrior cultures are shame-based and some of the significance there, why the opposite of shame is honor, selflessness, love. We're going to talk about the will to victory. Again, this is basically warriors have always had to push to try to get to victory. It's incredibly difficult to do, just like it's difficult to do any other significant task. And so I think there's some interesting stories there. We're going to talk about the concept of leading from the front, especially this Israeli officer concept called follow me. And then obviously I'm a massive fan of Sparta. A lot of the books in the story are Spartan in nature, come from Sparta. And so we're going to talk about a bunch of those tales. So first let's talk about what is the warrior ethos. Well, the dictionary defines ethos as the moral character, nature, disposition, and customs of a people or culture. Ethos is derived from the same Greek root as ethics. The warrior ethos is a code of conduct, a conception of right and wrong, of virtues and vices. Here's a quote from the book. The warrior ethos evolved from the primary need of the spear-toting, rock-throwing, animal-skin-wearing hunting band, the need to survive. This need could be met only collectively as a group working in unison to bind the band together. An ethos evolved, a hunter's ethos. Every warrior virtue proceeds from this. Courage, selflessness, love of, and loyalty to one's comrades, patience, self-command, the will to endure adversity, it all comes from the hunting band's need to survive. The warrior ethos evolved as a counterpoise to fear and self-preservation. In the era before gunpowder, all killing was of necessity done hand-to-hand. For a Greek or Roman warrior to slay his enemy, he had to get so close that there was an equal chance that the enemy's sword or spear would kill him. This produced an ideal of manly virtue, which is Andrea in Greek, that prized valor and honor as highly as victory. For the god who ruled the battlefield was fear, or phobos, which is Greek for fear. Courage, in particular stalwartness in the face of death, must be considered the foremost warrior virtue, a short Roman story on courage. A detachment of Romans was cut off in a waterless place. The enemy commander demanded their surrender. The Romans refused. You're surrounded, declared the enemy captain in exasperation. You have neither food nor water. You have no choice but to surrender. The Roman commander replied, no choice? Then have you taken away as well the option to die with honor? Stephen Pressfield does an amazing job in this book of basically going through deep historical examples and stories and then trying to connect it to how the warrior ethos lives on today. And part of, you know, how we talked about that is, is how warriors are taught. They're taught on the football field. They're taught in the mountains of the Hindu Kush. Courage is modeled for the youth by fathers and older brothers, by mentors and elders. It is inculcated in almost all cultures by a regiment of training and discipline, which typically culminates in an ordeal of initiation. The Spartan youth receives his shield. The paratrooper is awarded his wings. The Afghan boy is handed his AK-47. The warrior ethos demands respect for the enemy. The foe is granted full honor as a fighting man and defender of his home soil. And values from Cyrus through Alexander to the Greeks and Romans on down to Rommel and the Africa corpse. Today's enemy was considered tomorrow's potential friend and thus granted his full humanity. And this, you know, I'll just go off on a quick aside. 
There are many, many, many examples of this. There are examples of, for instance, Sparta fighting their neighbors, not because they wanted to fight their neighbors, but because they wanted to galvanize the support of everyone to be able to fight King Xerxes. And so one of the things that they would do is do this fight they didn't really want to do because they effectively their neighbor was going to go and partner up with King Xerxes or kind of an enemy warrior culture. And so they would fight them. But the first thing that they would do is basically flip all of the norms after the battle. And so when the battle was over, they would immediately dispatch their messenger to tell the foe that the war was over. They were not going to obviously pillage or do anything. The Spartans never did that. And that they granted, you know, they they wanted them to be their friends going forward and that the war was fought out of necessity. And so there are many examples throughout history of people effectively saying, we're going to fight you, but I'm going to forge you your full honor. And at the end of the day, the whole goal is to make you fear me if in case that's helpful, in case that needs to happen, in case we need to enter kind of a conflict. But ultimately, my goal is to make you a partner. And so I'm both trying to show up as a strong adversary when that's needed. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I want us to work together. And and I think it's just interesting and kind of helpful to expand on that. One of the other notes is last note I'm going to make in this particular section is for better or worse, the majority of fighters throughout history have all been men. And so throughout this book, you know, one of the things that kind of bugged me a bit is just everything is is written generally from, from man's perspective. And, you know, it is what it is. But Stephen Pressfield has a section in the book, I think, very needed that it just makes it clear that the warrior ethos has nothing to do with men alone. You know, the lioness hunts, the alpha female defends the wolf pack. The warrior ethos is not a manifestation of male aggression or the masculine will to dominance. It rests on the will and resolve of mothers, wives, daughters, and female warriors to defend their children, their home soil, and the values of their culture. Okay, so the next section we're going to go on is warrior cultures and and why they're shame-based. And the reason I think this is interesting, it'll kind of make sense. I think shame here generally sounds bad, But, you know, I think what's important to understand is, you know, victory is important, but more important than victory is honor. And what honor effectively looks like in war is that you didn't give up. You did everything that you possibly could. And it's this will to victory. It's this will to overcome. It's this will to be able to kind of rise above. And so the reason that's important is if you think about, okay, well, what's the opposite? Well, the opposite is shame. And effectively, throughout all warrior cultures, shame was used to try to mold people so that they would emulate these traits that are effectively being the best versions of themselves. And so that's some of the context here. Almost all warrior cultures are shame-based. One example from Sparta. The maidens of Spartans were taught songs of ridicule with which to humiliate any young man who displayed want of courage in battle. When a warrior accused of being a trembler returned to the city, the pretty young girls clustered around him, mocking him and defaming him with these anthems of shame. Not particularly positive, but it's a thing. And, you know, the whole reason that this was done And it makes sense in the context of Sparta, where the entire society basically lived and existed, you know, as warrior culture, like through and through. Makes sense in that culture, obviously probably wouldn't translate super well today. If a Spartan youth failed to show courage in battle, his fiancée would actually abandon him. The magistrates would not permit him to marry. If he was married already, he and his wife were forbidden to have children. If the warrior had sisters of marriageable age, their suitors would be compelled to take to part from them the man's whole family would be shamed. Obviously, you know, just another extreme example, but, you know, it's an example. And I think part of this is just to show how things have changed, how the warrior cultures evolved over time. You know, I think these are some interesting examples. Here's one that I think is just kind kind of incredible from the book. The Spartans revered courage and honor above all else, setting it at times an unrealistically high bar for both. And I think here's a really interesting example. At Thermopylae in 480 BC, Every one of the 300 Spartans died resisting the Persian invaders, except one, a warrior named Aristodemus, who was withdrawn at the last minute because of eye inflammation had rendered him temporarily blind. It's me butting in for a second. You know, literally somebody that's blind. I don't think it's fair (laughs) to say you can't see. You should still go and and fight courageously and, and do this for your brothers. If you're blind, you know, you're blind. So that's kind of the fact here. Okay, back to the quote. He was pulled from the battlefield because he was temporarily blind and they made that call. The next year, the Spartans again faced the Persians at Plataea in central Greece. This time, Aristodemus was healthy and fought in the front rank. So there's multiple ranks in battle. He's in the front rank. Obviously, the most difficult. You know, you're seeing the most action. You're you're meeting the kind of enemy first. When the battle was over, all who had witnessed his actions agreed that Aristodemus had earned the prize of valor. So brilliant and relentless had been his courage. But the magistrates refused to award him this honor, judging that he was driven by such shame that he had risked his life recklessly deliberately seeking to die. So again, it goes to show you, I think, what the Spartans revered and also just how unrealistically high their bar was for what valor and courage and honor really look like. 
Okay, so we talked about shame-based cultures and that warriors typically have shame-based cultures. Well, what's the opposite of shame? Well, it's honor, it's selflessness, it's love. And here's a couple of examples. Once in India, and this is incredible, and I'll just say kind of a quick preload. I didn't know a lot about Alexander the Great. Stephen, I've learned a lot since kind of reading more, but Stephen Pressfield is probably the world's foremost scholar on Alexander the Great. He's written multiple books about Alexander the Great. He has, I think, extracted just some fascinating insights and and stories about Alexander the Great. And the more I've learned about Alexander the Great, the more I've come to really love and respect him, especially the way that he shows up as a leader. Here is a great example. Once in India, after years on campaign, Alexander the Great's men threatened to mutiny. They were worn out and wanted to go home. Alexander called an assembly. When the army had gathered, the young king stepped forth and stripped naked. These scars on my body, Alexander declared, were got for you, my brothers. Every wound, as you see, is in the front. Let that man stand forth from your ranks who has bled more than I, or endured more than I for your sake. Show him to me, and I will yield to your weariness and go home. Not a man came forward. Instead, a great cheer arose from the army. And there are many stories like this. I actually did not include all of the stories about Alexander the Great inside this book summary. I think this is the most interesting, but you know, like what's interesting about this particular quote? Well, I think one of my big gripes about leadership as it often happens today is that there's very little skin in the game, meaning there's, there's many, many, many examples of, you know, quote unquote leaders you could point to. This could be CEOs. These could be leaders of teams, leaders of companies who are effectively in a position where they have no skin in the game. So they will benefit if things go well They will take none of the burden if things go poorly. And I think, you know, unfortunately, we live in a world where that's kind of become the norm. And it's actually very uncommon to find leaders with skin in the game, especially intentionally. And so here then is Alexander effectively going to his men and saying, and, you know, another piece, and I'm sure I'll butcher this slightly, but Alexander the Great, one of the things that was known about him is that he always led his army from the front. So whenever his army would go and attack, Alexander the Great would be in this crazy double-headed helmet with his war horse, which everybody knew his name was Bucephalus. It was, you know, be decked out. So it was immediately clear to anybody, including his own army and the enemy's army, who Alexander the Great was. And he made himself a very attractive target. But his entire perspective was that if I'm leading, I'm leading from the front. And then here's an example of him effectively saying his men are tired. They're worn out. They want to go home. And he doesn't demean them. He doesn't go and yell at them. He doesn't give them nice things that make them feel slightly better. You know, he literally strips down, shows them his scars, show that it's all in the front of the body as none on the back of the body, which you typically get from fleeing. And he said, let, you know, the man stand before me that has more scars on his body than me. Not a man came forward. There's literally nobody else. And so I think I take an enormous amount of inspiration from leaders who lead from the front. We're going to come back to that theme later on. Warriors advancing into battle are more afraid of disgrace in the eyes of their fellow warriors than they are of the spears and lances of the enemy. It's part of shame would be, yeah, you're worried about dying. I think honor in this case, selflessness, valor in this case is effectively saying, no, I'm, I'm fighting for the people that are beside me. I am much more worried about how they will perceive me and how I'll show up than of any kind of mortal wounds that I could end up getting. There's a whole chapter on the warrior's sense of humor. This is kind of my favorite bit from it. You know, the warrior's sense of humor is terse, it's dry, it's dark. It literally doesn't solve a problem. Its purpose is to deflect fear and to reinforce unity and cohesion. The warrior ethos dictates that the soldier make a joke of pain and laugh at adversity. And I'm not going to share it here. There's a couple of quotes we'll come to at the end around Sparta that, that I'll bring up this idea of kind of warrior humor that are just amazing. And it'll make more sense when we hear those quotes. But I think this idea of warrior's humor being dark and terse and dry, and that it's meant to deflect anything from an individual and take it back on to the group. This is something we're all doing together. And it's also meant to deflect fear and reinforce this unity and cohesion. And it's also, it's not a joke to solve a problem. It's not actually trying to solve any problem at all. It's just all about that we're in this together. And that's why it tends to be terse and dry and dark. There's quite a bit in the book about the will to victory. I kind of cobbled together a few things that I really liked about what this means and I think why it's important. The will to fight, the passion to be great, is an indispensable element of the warrior ethos. It is also a primary quality of leadership because it inspires men and fires their hearts with ambition and the passion to go beyond their own limits. And this is an example I just thought was incredible. And kind of the takeaway is, you know, often the battle isn't won on the field, It's won the night before in preparation. So here's an example. A lesson on when the battle is won. A Roman general was leading his legions toward the enemy in a swampy country. He knew that the next day's battle would be fought on a certain plain because it was the only dry and flat place for miles. He pushed his army all night, 
marching them through frightening and formidable swamp so that they reached the battle before the foe and could claim the higher ground. In the aftermath of victory, the general called his troops together and asked them, Brothers, when did we win the battle? One captain replied, Sir, when the infantry attacked. Another said, Sir, we won when the cavalry broke through. No, said the general. We won the night before, when our men marched through the swamp and took the high ground. So again, I think it's just, you know, it's you can take from that what you, what you want to kind of extrapolate, but I think this idea of the will to victory and the things that you will do to make sure that you put yourself in his most advantageous position as possible. It's an incredible, incredible example. Here's another example of the war to victory. It's very, very, very different. And this is actually a story of, you know, the Spartans were nearly almost defeated. They were defeated a couple times in battle. This is basically a story of one of the times they were defeated and how it was done. Epaminondas, the great Theban general, was the first to beat the Spartans at the Battle of Leuctra in 371 BC. Here's how he did it. The evening before the fight, Epaminondas called his warriors together and declared that he could guarantee victory on the morrow if his men would vow to perform one feat at the moment he commanded it. The men, of course, responded, A. What do you wish us to do? When I sound the trumpet, said Epaminondas, I want you to give me one more foot. Do you understand? Push the enemy back just one foot. I'm just going to pause here for a second. You know, imagine being part of that group and just thinking, what? And that's going to guarantee his victory? But, you know, they end up kind of agreeing to this. The men swore they would do this. The battle came. The armies clashed and locked up, shield against shield, each side straining to overcome the other. And remember, at this point in time in war, basically the way to think about it was it's like watching a boxing match or a battle that would just go on until someone was either so exhausted they couldn't continue or they were defeated. That's effectively what war looked like at this point in time. Epaminondas watched and waited till he judged both armies had reached the extremity of exhaustion. Then he ordered the trumpet sounded. The warriors of Thebes, remembering their promise, summoned their final reserves of strength and pushed the foe back only one foot. This was enough. The Spartan line broke. A rout ensued. When you're ready to give up, can you summon the strength to push forward just one more foot? It's an incredible story. You know, I think it's a really interesting example. Okay, so we're going to move on to leading from the front. And again, a lot of how I think about why this is valuable is I'm sure I, like everyone, like all of you that are listening, I want to show up as the best version of myself. And I think a big part of that is just leadership. And I think true leadership is very different than you know, I think there's a lot of forms of leadership. I think true leadership is actually makes up a very small percentage of them. Um, a lot of people try to lead hierarchically. A lot of people try to lead by being the loudest, by being the meanest, by being the most kind of condescending. And I think what I find a lot of inspiration from is in just some amazing stories that I can latch onto and, and remember of how to think about leadership, I think, the right way. During the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, and all of Israel's subsequent conflicts, casualties sustained by officers have exceeded proportionally by far those suffered by men of the enlisted ranks. So what does this mean? This means that, you know, it, like in any army, there's officers that are leading enlisted men. The officers are effectively the leaders. They're calling the shots. Uh, you would think the officers would probably never die. You know, the officers would be somewhere in a safe in a, in a safe place calling the shops in some sort of forward operating base. But that's not the case. And it, the reason is because the primary leadership principle that Israeli officers are taught is just called follow me. And it's literally, I think, relates to what we just talked about with Alexander the Great. They lead by being the first. They lead by literally saying, I'm a peer. I'm right alongside you. I'm just going to happen to be first. And I think it's an incredibly important way of, of leading as a peer, leading by saying, following me, leading by taking the risk, taking the leap first. One of the most admirable traits of the warrior ethos is its embrace of skin the game. This is my commentary. Warriors demand that their leaders lead from the front, that they share in their burdens and sacrifices, as well as the honor attained by fighting with courage and selflessness. Leadership outside of war is often completely devoid of skin in the game. Leaders reap the spoils without any real risk or ownership for failures, which is why so many of the world's great leaders were warriors and warrior leaders. Okay, here's another quote story from the book. During the Sinai campaign of 1956, the commander of an Israeli armored regiment violated orders and attacked down the length of the Mitla Pass, sacrificing numerous men and vehicles to capture a strong point that was later given up. So effectively, people end up dying, you know, worst outcome of all. A bunch of vehicles end up getting destroyed, but, you know, it captures a strong point, just happens that that strong point ends up getting given up. So despite public outrage at this act of insubordination, the Israeli commander-in-chief, General Moshe Dayan, refused to discipline the man. I will never punish an officer for daring too much, but only too little. So I think this is important because 
just this idea of one remembering, I think in this general's case, he wasn't the person on the front line. And ultimately, at the end of the day, he wants his officers to dare too much rather than too little or to effectively have that will to victory as opposed to not have that will to victory. And so this is a case where, yes, there was a lot of not so great outcomes of this particular call. But at the end of the day, I think it's interesting the general's assessment was not to punish an officer for daring too much, but only too little. There's an ancient precept that killing the enemy is not honorable unless the warrior places himself in harm's way and gives the enemy an equal chance to kill him. Similarly, the samurai code of Bushido forbade the warrior from approaching an enemy by stealth. Honor commanded that he show himself plainly and permit the foe a fighting chance to defend himself. And obviously, you know, this is not practiced today. You know, if there was an armored conflict, you know, an element of surprise is incredibly important. But, you know, I think part of this is just not all of the aspects of warrior ethos have made it to today. Not all of them show up as equally as as they used to in combat. Obviously, it's very different. Today, there's typically war happens more at a distance where before it happened literally sword against sword. You were right up against whoever you were fighting. And so obviously things were different then, but I think it's interesting to think about these examples and think about what to learn from them and what they mean and why they ever happened. Okay, last example, leading from the front, and a lot of these are loosely grouped around Israel's warrior culture, which I think is really interesting. Soldiers of the Israeli Defense Forces who often must fight against enemies who target civilians, who strike from or stockpile weapons within houses of worship, and who employ their own women and children as human shields are taught to act according to the principle of Tohar Ha Neshek, purity of the weapon, which is derived from two verses in the Old Testament. What it means is that the individual soldier must reckon himself what is the moral use of his weapon and what is the immoral use. When an action is unjust, the warrior must not take it. Here's what I think is so interesting. I've been following the war in Ukraine since it broke out, in part because it's, I think, the first major war where you have a country that's literally just fighting for its democracy from an invading force. And I won't get any more specific than this, but there's been numerous examples of just incredibly unjust things that have happened in that battle. And I think when you look at statements and philosophies like this, where, where Israel is effectively saying, yes, we are sending you to go and defend your homeland and, and to you know kill others. But at the end of the day, you as a soldier have to reckon about the pure use of your weapon. And when it's moral to use it, you should use it. And when it's immoral to use it, you must not take that action. And I think it's important because in war, you know, uh, there can often be this idea that it's zero sum and so anything goes. And I think what, what I like about, you know, this is just the recognition and the embrace of this idea that, yes, that may be true, it's maybe zero sum, and yet it's going to be incredibly, you know, ultimately, if we survive, you know, what comes after this, what we do, the actions that we take are going to be judged very harshly, you know, and scrutinized very harshly coming out of this. And so I think this is an interesting concept of just purity of the weapon and uh, for each soldier reckoning for themselves the moral use of their weapon and what's immoral and making sure that they follow that. Okay, so this last section is just really tales from Sparta. And so we're going to cover a bunch of ground. This is probably the, maybe the most snippets out of the book. You know, Sparta was just a fascinating culture. And so I think it's really interesting. Plutarch asked, why do the Spartans punish with a fine the warrior who loses his helmet or spear, but punish with death the warrior who loses his shield? The answer, because the helmet and spear are carried for protection of the individual alone, but the shield protects every man in line. The group always comes before the individual. I'll leave it at this, but if you want an interesting story, I highly recommend listen to The Gates of Fire. Uh, there's a whole scene in that story around the significance of the shield and, and what happens effectively if Spartan warriors did not treat it with respect. And, and again, why was the shield important? Because in the line of battle, the shield, basically, they, they would all of their shields would form up and almost look like inseparable scales on a snake. And so it was all about protecting every the man next to you on both sides and, and basically protecting your homeland and protecting everyone that's fighting alongside you. Um, and so it's, I think it's interesting. Bunch of other stories. At Thermopylae on the final morning, when the last surviving Spartans knew they were going to die, they turned to one of their leaders, the warrior Dionikis, and asked him what thoughts they should hold in their minds in this final hour to keep their courage strong. Dionikis instructed his comrades to fight not in the name of such lofty concepts as patriotism, honor, duty, or glory. Don't even fight, he said, to protect your family or your home. Fight for this alone. The man who stands at your shoulder, he is everything, and everything is contained in him. In ancient Sparta, Lycurgus took the city from a normal society to a warrior culture. Here's how he did it. So that no man would have grounds to feel superior to another, Lycurgus divided the country into 9,000 equal plots of land. To each family, he gave one plot. He decreed that the men no longer be called citizens, but peers or equals, so that no man might compete 
With another or put on heirs over wealth, Lycurgus outlawed money. A coin sufficient to purchase a loaf of bread was made of iron the size of a man's head and weighing over 30 pounds. So ridiculous was such, co such coinage that men no longer coveted wealth but pursued virtue instead. Furthermore, Lycurgus outlawed all occupations except warrior. He decreed that no name could be inscribed on a tombstone except that of a woman who died in childbirth or a man killed on the battlefield. So a couple of things here. Obviously, like anything you're going to read about Sparta, if you can do enough research, kind of every, <laughs> every story, every example that they set was just such an extreme. And this is obviously another example. You know, so outlawing money, the only coin is made of iron. It can be used to purchase a loaf of bread. It's the size of a man's head and it weighs over 30 pounds. Imagine taking that, trying to go purchase a loaf of bread. Um, but there's some other things that are amazing. So I think part of this is just Sparta did not used to be a warrior culture. And part of making it a warrior culture was saying, we're all going to have everything equally. So everyone's going to have the same plot of land. No one's a citizen. We're not going to have a hierarchy. So money's not a thing. Class isn't a thing. Everyone's going to be a peer or an equal. And then obviously the two things that they celebrated above all else was childbirth and, and men being killed on the battlefield, or at least fighting and, and defending Sparta. And, and so they made that, made those the only two roles that if, if you had died in childbirth or if you were killed on the battlefield, you would get a tombstone with your name inscribed on it, but otherwise you would not. Um, I think it's just, just, it's kind of fascinating. It's a fascinating example of how you might go about taking a normal society and trying to make it a warrior culture. The Spartan leader Leonidas famously said on the final morning at Thermopylae, this is an example of warrior humor, now eat a good breakfast, men, for we're all sharing dinner in hell. And there's a version of that quote in the movie 300. It's supposedly a real thing that was said um, at the battle. Here's another quote. <laughs> I think this is fascinating. Um, so if you're, you know, anyone in the military uh, typically likes to keep things as short as possible, I think this example is just amazing. Spartans like to keep things short once one of their generals captured a city. His dispatch home said city taken. The magistrates fined him for being verbose. Taken, they said, would have sufficed. <laughs> so here's an example, literally sends two words back. And they said, that's a great, could have only dealt with one. And they literally find him. And this is someone that ended up uh, capturing a, a city. They find the general because he said city taken instead of just taken. As the Spartans were preparing their defensive positions, a native of Trachis, uh, this is another example of warrior humor. Trachis was the site of the pass, came racing into camp out of breath and wide eyed with terror. He had seen the Persian horde approaching as the tiny contingent of defenders gathered around, the man declared that the Persian multitude was so numerous that when their archers fired their volleys, the massive arrows blocked out the sun. Good, declared Dionikis, then we'll have our battle in the shade. The most famous Spartan mother story is also the shortest. A Spartan mother handed her son his shield as he prepared to march off to battle. She said, come back with this or on it. And here's another story kind of similar, a little bit more crude. The warriors' brothers were fleeing from the enemy back towards the city. So these are uh, citizens of, uh, of Sparta. I guess they'd be called, you know, peers or equals, not citizens. Um, and they were fleeing battle. They were running back to the city. Their mother happened to be on the road and saw them running toward her. She lifted her skirt above her waist and said, where do you think you're running? Back here from whence you came? So basically the mom was saying, you need to turn around to get back there to battle. What are you doing? This is embarrassing. You have no honor. Um, and she was shaming them. In Sparta, boys were allowed to stay with their mothers till they were seven. At that age, they were taken from their families and enrolled in the agogi, which is called the upbringing. This training lasted till they were 18, so lasted 11 years, started when they were seven. And at 18, they were considered grown warriors and were enrolled in the army. So they were even given a break. You know, it's basically trained from seven all the way to 18. Then it, once you're a grown warrior, you're enrolled in the army. Here's a look at the conditions they trained in. The boys in training were given one garment, a rough cloak that they wore all year long. They slept out of doors year-round. Each boy carried a sickle-like weapon called a zieli. They were allowed no beds, but instead had to make nests of reed gathered each night from the river. They were not permitted to cut the reeds with their sickles, but had to tear them with their bare hands. Food for the boys in training was similarly Spartan, typically pig's blood porridge. And I literally looked up what that was. I couldn't find a great example of what Spartan pig's blood porridge was, but it seems like basically porridge with clotted blood, clotted pig's blood, added to it, which is very nutritious, obviously probably didn't have a lot of flavor and, and wasn't, you know, the, it's not a pastry. <laughs> and this is related. A visiting Spartan envoy was once given a taste of this pig's blood porridge and said, now I understand Spartan courage in battle, for surely death is preferable to dining upon such slop. Okay, a couple other stories and then, and then we'll wrap. At Thermopylae in 480 BC, every one of the 300 Spartans died resisting um, the Persian invaders, except one warrior named Aristodemus, who was withdrawn at the last minute because of eye inflammation had rendered him temporarily blind. 
The next year, the Spartans faced the Persians at Plataea in central Greece. This time, Aristodemus was healthy and fought in the front rank. When the battle was over, all who had witnessed his actions agreed that Aristodemus had earned the prize of valor. So brilliant and relentless had been his courage, but the magistrates refused to award him this honor, judging that he was driven by such shame that he risked his life recklessly, deliberately seeking to die. Once a Spartan was visiting Athens, his Athenian host threw a banquet in his honor. Wishing to show off for his guest, the Athenian indicated several illustrious personages around the table. That man there is the greatest sculptor in Greece. And that gentleman yonder is its finest architect. The Spartan indicated a servant from his own entourage. Yes, he said, and that man there makes a very tasty bowl of soup. So I think, you know, it's a little crude. But clearly, for Spartans, they only prized people that were willing to battle. It was a warrior culture. And so going to Athens and being introduced to a sculptor and architects, you know, I'm sure in your mind, you would probably judge that just as harshly as if someone did anything else other than just killing in, in, in being a warrior and kind of living and dying by battle. When the Spartans and their allies overcame the Persians at Plataea in 479 BC, the spoils included the great pavilion tents of King Xerxes. And you could read about these online. I mean, these things were massive, 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 massive tents. They would had like hundreds of birds and wild animals and, and um, in, inside of them. Along with the king's cooks, wine stewards, and kitchen servants. For a joke, the Spartan king, Pausanias, ordered the Persian chef to prepare a typical dinner, the kind they would make for the Persian king. Meanwhile, he had his own cooks whip up a standard Spartan meal. The Persian chefs produced a lavish banquet composed of multiple courses served on golden plates, topped off by the most sumptuous cakes and delicacies the Spartans' grub was barley bread and pig's blood stew. When the Spartans saw the two meals side by side, they burst out laughing. How far the Persians have traveled, declared Panesis, uh, to rob us of our poverty. Last story. Here's how Spartans got married. Lycurgus wanted to encourage passion because he felt that a child conceived in heat would make a better warrior, so a young Spartan husband could not live with his bride. He spent all day training and slept in the common mess. If the couple were to consummate their love, the husband had to sneak away from his messmates, then slip back before his absence was discovered. Because obviously, if, if he was discovered, he was going to be punished. And, you know, there's a couple other examples of this. One, the, the Spartans, you know, were fed very basic food. They were encouraged to go and steal, but they were, uh, it was absolutely against the law, and it was not seen as good at all for you to get caught. So here's another example where it was basically saying, it's, you know, good for you to go and steal, just make sure you don't get caught. Here's another example where it's like, it's good for you to go slip away and and go spend time with your lover, but you need to you need to slip away and you need to get back before you're discovered and no one can catch you. It was not uncommon for a young husband to be married for four or five years and never see his bride in daylight except during public events and religious festivals. And that is the first book summary for The Warrior Ethos by Stephen Pressfield. And as I said at the beginning, the next episode I'm really excited about, it's a book that I think is incredibly underrated uh, and it's actually uh, kind of an addendum to Good to Great by Jim Collins. And it's all about a flywheel. And, you know, there's this concept in business of a flywheel, which is basically, I think, the, the way that I like to describe it is if you're a founder, if you're an entrepreneur, everybody needs to know what drives their business, what allows you to actually be able to accelerate momentum, what makes customers choose you. And you need to make sure that everything you do is, is aligned. So as an example, just a really loose proxy example, people frequently will cite Costco as a great example of a company with a, a flywheel. Because obviously, and I think this is, it's very common for kind of discount-based businesses to be given this kind of credit, but it applies to many, many, many other businesses. But effectively for Costco, the idea is they're going to offer people the lowest prices by negotiating directly with manufacturers and suppliers to be able to get those low prices by selling stuff in bulk so that customers can come in and pay the lowest price. And then they take everything that they make and try to continue to lower prices for customers. And so I've kind of very simplified it there. I've kind of done a crude approximation of a flywheel. But that is an example of if you were trying to explain well, why does Costco work and why is Costco growing and how does Costco retain customers? So much of it can very simply be explained by just thinking about the business as a flywheel. And so that's the next book we're going to cover. It's a flywheel. It's just going to be a short excerpt with a bunch of examples by Jim Collins. I hope you've enjoyed the Warrior Ethos. To listen to more of these, go to outlieracademy.com to explore other episodes.